if you loved uh, if you loved the last one, uh, and I know you did, you'll really love this one too. I uh, I don't uh, I don't hold back anything. I'm always talking about receptors. I'm always talking about magnets of action again. So to explain why, to help you remember why some of these things. In dealing with vasopressors and inotropes, these are some things that you have access to. I have to give you why is one drug preferred over another, not because somebody told you so, but to tell you physiologically speaking why. And granted, it's probably going to match your protocol. So what? But now you know why. And if you ever had to deviate from protocol, granted, you would get whipped and you know and yelled at. Maybe you would at least can hypothesize why you would need to deviate or you know, maybe I need to call for med control and, and, and ask for something. So my objective, pair and contrast some of these things. Obviously, volume status in your critically ill patients. Kind of talk about what physiologically is going on when someone is actually in shock. There's a couple of different shocks, OK? They're hypotensive. That's what you know. But why are they hypotensive? There's different reasons for, to be hypotensive and in shock. Um, List uh, some of these uh, blood pressure or cardiac output things. Uh, talk about lactic acid and some of the other uh, things that we would be looking for in the hospital. And I'm giving it to you, and you're like, but we don't do any of this. I know. What happens if you pick a patient up and transfer them to another hospital? They may, you may have some of this at your disposal. I'm not saying you're doing anything with it, but it's there. I want you to know why is it there. Okay? Right? This is what else you can possibly be doing, right? Taking an intense person from one place to another, right? Because if I'm wrong, I can just shut up now. And don't, don't tell me I'm wrong because you don't want me to shut up. I'm wily, you know, so. Also describe the catecholamine and vaso, the catecholamine and vasopressors and inotropes. I'd like to tell you what, what makes them somewhat different. And what are some clinical endpoints you need to look for when, you're, when these are running? Pretty much what that I was all saying. What is shock? I'm shocked. No, I'm not. Because if I was shocked, it would be a life-threatening condition that occurs when the body is not getting enough blood flow. So there's many things that can cause not getting enough blood flow. Can lead to, uh, obviously, if left in shock, can lead to your organs not doing well because they're not getting enough blood flow. Okay, As blood is going to be shunted, and blood is always shunted to your brain. You know, you can live without kidneys, your body knows this, your brain not so much. So everything always tends to shunt to the brain. Brain, heart, but you know, you don't do well without, you know, liver, all these other things. So shock requires like immediate medical help. Okay? Types of shock. Hypovolemic. That's a big word. What does that mean? Yeah, low volume, hypovolemic, low volume. They either lost blood, paid for college by plasma, I don't know. You know, they lost blood, right? Okay. Cardiogenic shock, what does that mean? Yeah, it generates from the heart. The heart is the problem. So you're not getting enough blood flow because the pump's broken. If your sump pump is broken, your basement's flooded. Kind of same thing with this. Well, we'll talk about it. Distributive shock and obstructive shock. An obstructive shock could be a massive clot. Or if we have a massive clot in, let's say, our lung area, we like to call it a PE. You don't tend to live long with a massive PE, right? So these things are obviously of major so what will affect blood pressure? This is not rocket science. I, don't, I am not telling you anything that is not painfully obvious, OK? If, you're, if your pump is not working, as we talked about, your sump pump is not working, you have a backup, things are, your obviously bl blood flow is not going if your heart is not working, OK? So you got an MI, some arrhythmia, acute heart failure, some valvular disease, right? Heart's not working well. Hypovolemia, hemorrhage, intractable diarrhea. You always forget about that. You picked up some boy, they poop themselves. You can lose a lot of volume 
in stool. You know, funny, you know, guys, yeah, funny, you know, we always talk about poop from when we were like this little, you know. We'll still laugh a little bit about it. Not so funny when you poop out four liters or more, you know. You're, you can lose a lot of water and a lot of salt. Heat stroke, same thing. Lay out in the sun, do a lot of work in the sun. Technically, could be coming into a shock. We kind of forget about those things. We're like, yes, okay, we know about it. We pick these people up. It can be very dangerous as well. Decreased cardiac output and vasodilation. This happens in sepsis or sometimes in drugs-induced anaphylactic shock is the same thing. And uh, neurotrauma. If you uh, actually wind up uh, damaging your, or shocking or damaging your spinal cord, you'll become hypotensive enough because the nerves supplying the vessels stop and those vessels open up and they become hypotensive. And for a short period of time, you need to give them a presser to get those, to get those back. They'll, they'll bounce back eventually. But if you don't recognize it, the person can actually die on you. Not only do you go from a neck injury, you can go into a, a shock because the vasculature will open up because they're not getting that neurotone. Is everything that is leading, that leads someone to death is always a vicious cycle. So you get this vicious cycle, whatever it is, you're not supplying enough blood. So you get inadequate blood flow to the organs, your tissues become hypoxic. We're a dual fuel system, so if you don't get enough oxygen, what's going to do? You're going to switch to anaerobic metabolism. Anaerobic metabolism makes lactic acid in a short period of time when you're running really hard, that's okay. You can stop and you can start breathing and it's good. But when you can't and you keep building up lactic acid, it becomes a problem. Then you get a metabolic acidosis, causes cardiac depression, which then causes inadequate blood flow to the tissue, which then causes more and more and more. And you can spiral yourself right out. Okay? So you've got to break this somehow. Any, any, of these, any of these places. Stop that cycle. So how? How can we break this cycle? You know, where is the system broken? Like whoever you pick up, try to figure out, hey, wh they are low blood pressure, not getting a lot. Where is the system broken? Where can I intervene? If, you, if you, you're trying to figure out where is it initiating from is of great help. It's very hard to do, especially in the field. But, you know, something that, that we're all trying to do. Um, do I need a vasopressor? Maybe, maybe not. What happens if I had a vasopressor and it's really the heart? Am I helping the heart out? I'm adding stress to the heart. Oh, wow, the heart was actually sick. We'll talk about that in a little bit. How much of a vasopressor is too much? When I start making the heart sick and sicker, let's say the heart wasn't the sick part, but I can make the heart sick with my vasopressors. Sorry, this is more of a joke if anybody knows uh, 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 the movie Sure Thing, unfortunately, is from the 80s. And I'm old. Anyway, who made liquid soap and why? It's, anyway. Let's, uh, we can talk about some of these. Uh, we're going to talk about monitoring, and we'll go quickly through the monitoring. This is a lecture I give to, to many people, so I apologize. Some of this monitoring stuff may not always apply to you, but it will apply if you pick patients up from one ICU to another. Okay. So we'll talk about, so we'll answer five of the six. I don't know who made liquid soap and why. But they probably made a lot of money. Hemodynamic and oxygen transport monitoring. Blood pressure is, is the, the gold standard, okay? Mean arterial pressure is what, we, what we're really looking for. It's more of a mean than like systolic, okay? I want to know what that average is. That's what your mean gives you. What is the heart rate? If I could figure out cardiac output, to get cardiac output, I need an invasive line placed. I can't get cardiac output in the emergency department either. So I'm in the same boat you are. I can't get that. I can just kind of go by my other signs and symptoms. Well, I don't think their heart's working too good. Okay? You look at how they're oxygenating, stuff like that. Cardiac index is actually your cardiac output, and I'll talk about all these, over body surface area. Stroke volume is how much squeeze, how much volume is being ejected when their heart is beating. Central venous pressure, that is how much pressure is in your venous system. When we look at your blood pressure, that's how much pressure that's in your arteries, right? 
as your blood goes from your arteries to the capillaries. The capillaries are large, very spacious, okay? You lose a lot of, pre a lot of pressure. When you talk about like 120 over 80 is what we look for for blood pressure. On the venous side, we're looking like 10. That's how much pressure you lose as it goes into your venous side. And 10 is actually a great number. You're topped off. You're looking good. You got enough volume on board, right? You can also look at systemic, systemic vascular resistance. If I take your blood pressure right now, let's say it's a garden hose and you're doing fine and the spigot is turned on and I'm able to knock that knob off so I can't turn it up anymore. You got great pressure with the garden hose. I'm able to take off the garden hose and now I put on the fire hose. What well, was a great stream before, how is that streaming out now? Yeah, it's just, and that's what your, S, your SVR gives you, that systemic vascular resistance. They didn't lose any volume. The vascular just went big. This is what you see in sepsis. The heart's fine, the pump's working. The volume didn't go anywhere. I just put on some fire hoses. Uh, pulmonary, uh, this is a wedge pressure. A very, very special catheter gets this one. I, we almost never see this anymore. Um, but it's of great value. Pulmonary ar artery pressure, they would get on an echo. Some other, when you're looking at oxygen purposes, when you look at someone pulse ox, you're looking at their arterial oxygenation saturation, your SAO2. That's what you're looking at, a pulse ox. You like to see it at 100%. You like to see that, oh, hey, they're, or somewhere in the 90s is fine by me too, you know. But you're looking at 80s, well, they have COPD, maybe okay. I'm not necessarily happy, but, you know. You get a mixed venous. This becomes a little a lot more complicated. Uh, some of these other oxygenation stuff. But this t you can actually get to a point where you can find out how much oxygen you are delivering to the end cells, which actually gets to that whole vicious cycle thing when we were talking about we didn't deliver enough oxygen, which causes it to switch to, to a different uh, fuel system. Other lab value, CBC tells you, hey, how much blood somebody has. Electrolytes tells you how, can kind of point to how well the heart's looking, right? Metabolic panel, blood gas, lactate level as well. Your mean arterial pressure. It's very good for us to know. And your mean arterial pressure technically can be calculated. I know machines give it to you, but it can be calculated. Your heart is actively beating a third of the time. So you take your systolic blood pressure times one third. And guess what? It's not beating two thirds of the time. It's not right. I'm, you're like, ooh, voodoo math there, dude. I know. I know it's hard. But if it's a third of the time it's beating, two thirds of the time it's not. Let's take your diastolic pressure when it's not beating times two thirds. That give you your mean arterial pressure. That's how you calculate it. Okay. Why use the mean arterial pressure more so when you're evaluating this? It's because the arterial pressure is 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 an end point. Okay. You want to get that that average pressure up high enough that you're delivering enough oxygen to all the end cells. So if you're looking at systolically speaking, let's say I got a 120 over 2. Well, my mean pressure stinks. I'm not really delivering enough oxygen, okay? And when we're not, and if you're in a bypass surgery, they'll put you on a pump. Let's say they have to put you on pump. Your pressure's 50 over 50. It's a constant pump. It's not like, like your heart beating. It's a constant pump, okay? So it's really focusing on what we're looking for. Restra uh, we need a uh, restoration of adequate perfusion is really what you're looking for, coronaries, also your brain. Maps less than 50, you're not getting enough value, enough, enough delivery. SVR is your systemic vascular resistance, and this kind of shows when I talk about, you're going to see this more in sepsis, okay? Don't worry about it, calculate from central. CVP, we talked about already, I skipped that. Uh, what will affect your CVP? Blood volume. Um, what else? Also, if you're in some sort of r right heart failure. Will this make sense to you? If my pump is broken, will I see the backup before the pump or, or after the pump? We talked about our before the pump. So if my right heart is failing me, 
Say I had my RCA occluded and I, and I blew out the right side of my heart. My right heart is failing me now. Where will I see the backup? In the, in the body, the vasculature, right? So this should make some sense if my central venous pressure, which normally is low, is starting to get pretty high, there's a chance that your heart, right heart is failing. Eventually, right heart failure will lead to all heart failure on the left side as well. Heart rate, we know cardiac output is simply calculated if you know stroke volume. You know how much volume is being ejected. You take that times your heart rate, that gives you your cardiac output. That is an OK determinant on how your heart is doing, but it's not the best. The best determinant is cardiac index. Why? Our index is based on body surface area. If exactly, it's geared towards how much mileage that heart has to beat against. You take a very, very small person with that same output, doesn't have to travel through all that mileage. Now you take someone very tall, very large, that's a lot of vasculature mileage you need to pump against. Same thing as with hoses. If I link like as many hoses as I can, will that pressure be as good as if I only had like a really short hose? No, a really short hose is really firing out, right, from the source. So intuitively, it should make some sense. So when I'm looking at, granted, these numbers you can't get in the field. I can't get in the emergency department. But if I got somebody in the ICU, they probably have this hooked up. They probably have an immediate monitor or catheter that's giving them cardiac index. Give them cardiac output as well. But what you really want to look at, not output, you want to look at index, okay? You don't get these anymore. Wedge pressure is very important as well. It tells you how much backup you get. And what it is doing, I will tell you, you get it from a Swan Gans catheter. Not that you need to know that. Swan Gans catheter is what they would do is they would put the catheter in the right atria, put it in the right ventricle, blow up a balloon, and have it float into the pulmonary artery. Pretty dangerous. Yes, it is. That's why you don't do it too much anymore, OK? Because if you blow out any of those things, eh, you're probably hurting your heart, as in permanently hurting your heart and not living. But what that will tell you is how much pressure is in your lungs, OK? If the left side, which is the biggest side of my heart, is failing me, where's my backup going to be? In the lungs. I'm going to have a lot of lung backup or pressure. This one against catheter would tell me that kind of pressure. It would also tell you how much volume a person has on board. Your CVP is less invasive and can tell me the volume as well. But we used to use this one against catheter with this, with this wedge pressure to find out how, how good the left heart was working and see how much volume somebody had on board. Oxygen delivery, we will blow past this. Lactic acid, we already talked about. OK, if you've got someone who's hypotensive, I mean, it, and it could be shock, you know, what will you look for? Well, primary labs don't necessarily worry about What do you work about, like, for patient history? What do you want to know? Mezzeron. Have they been eating? Have they been pooping a lot? Is the poop in diarrhea? Has it been blood? Right? These are things that help you and help us when, you, when it gets there, OK? I mean, you guys tell us this stuff all the time when you drop people off. You're like, he pooped a lot of blood because I have to hose out the rig. I can tell you that right now, you know? I mean, you're, you're telling us this. So it could be hypovolemic, right? Could it be septic? They're feverish. They're hot. You know? You kind of know if someone's got somewhat of an infection. They were in the hospital and had some kind of surgery, and now that site is oozing with some pus. It doesn't take rocket science to go, there could be an infection there causing the hypotension, right? So some of these things are just painfully obvious, you know, as a possible source, things to think about. <laughs> Cardiogenic is harder to see unless they have a known CHF. Cardiogenic shock and CHF are fairly similar, fairly close, okay? Cardiogenic shock tends to be you weren't expecting it. Somehow the heart took a, took a shot took an unexpected turn. CHF tends to kind of gradually, come on, they didn't take enough LASIK stuff. You know, they're, they're already on treatments, more than likely. All right? An obstructive. 
So it causes trauma, it's obvious. GI bleed tends to be obvious. Intractable diarrhea tends to be obvious. Delivery of miscarriage, all these things are, are going to be obvious. You, you will know these upon picking the person up. Get them some fluids on board. All the certain labs. Cardiogenic causes MI. Obviously, that's, that's obvious. You're like, boy, I did an EKG, and it's tombstones. If the pharmacist can recognize it's an MI, you guys can too. Trust me, OK? Um, and arrhythmia, you can recognize that, right? Acute heart failure, yeah, tough to recognize. You know, if, if it's an unknown heart failure, it is tough to recognize. So then you're looking at some of those other things and weeding out. Well, they're not bleeding to death. It's a guy. He didn't have a miscarriage. You know, you, you go through all the other things, right? Babular disease, you're listening to the heart, and it seems like one's really loud or regurging really well. Um, if you can hear it without the stethoscope, that's probably the problem. If you hear the swoosh, swoosh of the heart without the stethoscope, by the way, that's a six out of six murmur. And then if you're looking at the grading, um, yeah, that's where it doesn't take much. That means their valve is pretty much shot. OK, sepsis, bacteria, fungal, or viral, tends to be the cause. Things you need to look for. Very quick facts, and again, an aside. OK, brought you through all that terrible stuff that you rarely look at to get you to some of this stuff that you do look at. Your best vasopressor in the world within normal limits, fluids. As long as blood pressure is low, best thing you do is give them some fluids. As long as they don't have CHF. I mean, even if you give someone 500, even with CHF, I ain't going to do much. Anything, you know. They'd have to be so brittle of a CHF person that you put them in full failure. I mean, they'd, they'd be living in the hospital on IV drips, trust me. So you're not going to harm anybody with 500. Might be not even a liter. You know, whatever your protocols are. So your best pressure in the whole world is always fluids. Always. Okay. Catecholamine receptor is less responsive when the patient is acidotic. That's a physiological fact. So let's say you have to start somebody on a presser and you know they're acidotic. It may not work real well. Right. Let's say somebody's coding. Let's say you, you come upon somebody who has already been coding and someone's doing CPR. And you give them some epi. And it didn't necessarily work. Right. They are probably acidotic. Because even though someone's doing CPR, let's say it's great CPR. It's not as good as the heart is it ever going to be. Okay? They are gradually getting more and more acidotic. You give somebody a milligram of epi, it's, the body will respond uh, less than a milligram. I can't tell you how much less but it's less than what it would normally be. So maybe the next step may work. You know, I'm just letting you know some of these things. If someone goes down in front of you, like they ever find out something they go down in front of you, that epi may work, right? Because they're not maybe as acidotic. So some of these physiological facts may help you to know, maybe I need to work this a little longer. Maybe I need to keep doing the things I'm doing, OK, to get to that same end point, OK? Main lead. Ludicrous amounts of catecholamine vaso, uh, vasopressors, which is when I'm talking to some of my pharmacy students, and I'm like, OK, let's say I want to start somebody on an epi drip. Do I want to start them at 2? Normally, I would like to. But if they're really acidotic, no. I don't want to start them at 2 mics a minute. You want to start them at 4, 8, something. Or titrate it quickly, knowing that I'm not their body is not going to see the same amount. <coughs> so it helps you to know I need to move faster with these drips than slower, because the person's probably acidotic. Okay? So some of these are just tricks of the trade, these things to know physiologically. Once you know that, you can get somebody better faster. And uh, what you have learned about heart failure really will apply in this cardiogenic shock stuff. It just applies. Okay? What I ask myself when I got someone who's hypotensive, I go, my first question is, is the heart okay? Is, a, is it a pump issue? That's always my first question. Because the other stuff's obvious. I mean, you seeing blood fall out of somebody, yeah, that's obvious. I know it's hypovolemic shock. It's good. You know, I don't, I don't even have to ask is a pump. But if blood isn't actively falling, is it a pump issue? Because that's something that's going to kill them right away. Is it an arrhythmia? Is it something like that? Is the heart OK? Heart seems like OK. All right. Then I'm looking, hey, is the piping OK? 
my vasculature okay? And is a supply is there a supply issue? Supply issue is always last from it because it's obvious. They've had a miscarriage. They've had some. It's so obvious. It seems, not always. The GI bleed that bled out well before you got there, and he cleaned himself up. You know, he bled out so much that he doesn't have much more to give. You start giving him fluids, all of a sudden, brrr, he starts going again. Oh, that's why he's hypotensive. I thought it was something else. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't obvious. Have I seen that? Yes. It wasn't obvious until you get the fluids back in them. Let's talk about some of these drugs that you can use. Yay. Dobutamine, you don't have access to immediately on a rig, I'm assuming. But you can pick somebody up who's on dobutamine. Okay. Dobutamine uh, affects catecholamine receptor, so obviously it's affected by acidosis. All it does is help the heart squeeze. Okay. Dobutamine, uh, it just affects the beta. Going through all this, all it will do is have the heart beat faster and stronger. That's all it does. Yay, that's great, right? Downside is, can produce hypotension. Oops. You normally don't want hypotension. Right. So you're going to normally not have dobutamine by itself. A rare case would be CHF. What happens is you've got to stretch receptors under your arch. Once they feel that pressure that activates them, they relax your vas vasculature. If you've got CHF, they're already stretched out. You can give a CHF patient dobutamine. It won't, they won't respond like that. They're already stretched out. You can see CHF patients getting dobutamine boluses, maybe even at home. Can happen. Dopamine. Well, dopamine's effect is three stage. It depends on, how, on your rate. Oh, going back to dobutamine. You can still use dobutamine as long as you take into account the patient, take into account their hypotension. So if you put on another vasopressor, that's going to block that hypotension. Put on norepi. Put on dopamine. Okay. When when do you want increased contractility? When do you want the heart to beat better? One of those shocks. Do you want it to beat better? Cardiogenic shock. Which, granted, you might not necessarily 100% know, but we we may finally figure it out once we figure out. Boy, their oxygenation, I, and I've actually done this. I don't have, I don't have these monitors to find out if they're cardiogenic shock. But I'm watching their, their pulse ox get better when I give them a slight bolus of epi. Hey, their pulse ox get better, and then it falls off. Hey, their pulse ox get better, and it falls off. Because I'm helping the heart beat a little bit better, but then it falls off. I'm like, I'm not thinking it's cardiogenic. Maybe I should get some dobutamine. Doesn't work all the time, but when you can see it. Dopamine has an effect that's based on your rate. Okay, do you guys have access to dopamine? Yes. Do you know the various rates that it's at? We'll give you different effects. All right, so at low dose, we used to call renal. We don't do this anymore. It doesn't, it, in theory, would help the kidneys be supplied. It doesn't. In practice, it doesn't work. Okay. So anybody that says they're doing renal dose dopamine, they're wrong. Intermediate rate, so 2 to 10. It stimulates the beta, which just means heart. Okay, so you get increased contractility, cardiac output. Your heart's beating better, and you also get um, uh, better perfusion all around in your heart. So between two and ten, you're really looking at kicking the heart better. You get you don't really get that hypotension like you do with the the dobutamine. That's why dopamine is a little bit better. When you're looking at just cardiogenic, you can go anywhere between 2 and 10 and, and get that almost same response you get with it from uh, dobutamine. Almost same response. Not fully. At high rates, now you're clamping. Anytime you see alpha, that is vasculature clamp down or causing hypertension or trying to increase someone's blood pressure. So you get less of that beta, you get more vasculature squeeze. So you get less heart kick and more vascular squeeze. So let's say I don't have cardiogenic shock. Let's say I just got sh septic shock. So the vasculature is big. I, I got the, instead of garden hose, I got the fire hose. Higher dose dopamine. Don't start at 2. Don't start at 10. If you know it's not cardiogenic. If it's sepsis, start, start at 10. Okay? Very high rates, then you're kind of really, uh, really not getting a, uh, you're really actually decreasing renal blood flow. That's all you're doing. Epinephrine, we all know epi, epi boluses. 
Anybody know how we came up with a milligram for, for code purposes? How they came up with a milligram? Anybody? It's uh, what the dose that they would use to restart a heart um, on, on average when they did open heart surgeries, you know, back in the 60s, 70s, whenever it was, okay? So kind of like a dose on average that they would help to kind of kick sort of heart that they had stopped. So that's how we came up with the milligram. Is it really science that's a milligram? No. It might even be weight-based. Who knows? You know, we, we haven't really found the science because it's tough to do a drug study on people dying. You know, it's tough to get the volunteers, know where the volunteers are, you know. And you definitely can't get, can't get college students to sign up for near-death experiences. So, well, they find that bad. Anytime you, anytime you see alpha, think of vasculature squeeze. Anytime you see beta, think of heart squeeze. This squeezes both. Alpha, so you get vascular squeeze, and you get the heart to kick. Epi is great for getting the heart to kick good, and also gets the vascular to squeeze. Downside is if you got a sick heart, yeah, I got that to squeeze better. Wait, I got, I'm working against this resistance. You can actually make a sick heart sicker. Because yes, you got it to beat harder against a lot more pressure. Okay, it's like taking your water pump that's not quite good in your car and flooring it. It always works better. Your pump is probably pumping faster. <coughs> until it dies, because it's probably going to, because it was already weak to start, right? And you mechanics out there, I'm trying to give you a visualization. So, epi is good when you look at getting the heart to work, but think about the effects afterwards. You, you will make a sick heart sicker. So as long as they don't have a cardiogenic issue, epi's not poor. Cardiogenic issue, you're gonna make it worse. You'll notice it. You notice, well, they, they look better when they tail off quick. Start thinking to yourself, maybe the heart's sick. Maybe I need my dopamine at 2 to 10. Norepi is epi-like. It's alpha and beta, gives you that vascular squeeze, gives you that beta, but a little less tachycardia. So a little less on squeeze on the heart. But same thing, you, you get same thing you get with epi, you probably much get with norepi. Okay, you don't have that access to you in the rig, but if you're transporting patients, sepsis protocols, norepi is the drug of choice. Phenylephrine is another drug you don't have on the rig, but, but you may be transporting. All it does is affect the alpha, essentially. doesn't do anything at all to the heart, so you just get vasculature squeeze. You can increase someone's blood pressure. And it doesn't do anything to the heart at all. Okay, so if they don't have a sick heart, fine. If they got a sick heart, you made it sicker really fast because it doesn't do anything for the heart at all. You just stress the heart out. Follow? Everything Everything's with me. Boring as heck, right? Staying awake. Wish I had my amphetamines to spread now, right? Vasopressin. You have vasopressin available for you, right? Vasopressin does not affect the catecholamine receptor at all, and it's working. So is it affected by acidosis at all? The answer is no, if you wish to have look ahead. Remember I said your catecholamine receptor is less responsive when you're acidotic? Your vasopressin is not. So let's say you come across somebody who has been down, someone's doing CPR, you don't know how long they've been down. Say it's B, Fib, B, TAC, whatever. You shock them, certainly. So they're still in it. Your assumption, because you don't know how long they've been down, could be that they're acidotic. I know your protocol says reach for Epi. Maybe reach for vasopressin. Because it will work the same potency as no matter what. Downside is, if it's a sick heart, you cause a lot of stress on a lot of vasculature resistance, a lot of stress on that heart, and you haven't helped the heart at all because it doesn't do anything for the heart at all. That's a give and take. Works no matter what, acidotic, not acidotic, doesn't matter. But if it was a heart issue, you don't know it's a heart issue. Obviously, you think it's a heart issue because the heart's not working well. But 
you don't have to worry about, hey, they're not getting the full thing. So trying to give you some hints when you're out in the field doing your, what you're doing. There's all that alpha beta stuff that I talked about. You can kind of link the drugs to where they are affecting. That's for your own benefit when you go home. A loose diagram of what the drugs, alpha, what's affecting the beta, and that visual graphish look. So you can link it up to where is it working. Because you, you're going to clamp down on, on any of these. You're clamping down on something. You're even clamping down on gut and stuff like that. Let's say you clamp down so hard, so long. We've got some patients in the ICU. We start to worry about, are we starving the gut of blood supply? Because we've been clamping on so long. We can cause more damage with this stuff. Yes, their body is alive, but eventually we're going to kill off something, possibly if we, if we overstretch stuff. So cardiogenic shock treatment. We need to increase their cardiac output, a.k.a. index. Possibly increase or decrease their resistance, right? If they got a sick heart, i got to worry about how much resistance they have. Goal is I want their cardiac index about 2.2. Granted, you don't have that index marker. I don't have that index marker either. But you, you can see that they're delivering oxygen better. You can just see that. And a wedge pressure or a CVP, a CVP of 10 and a wedge pressure of 15. Same thing like CHF. Cardiogenic shocks like CHF. Luckily, there was uh, somebody back in the, well, I don't know when this was. Forrester's hemodynamic classification kind of did with CHF. They don't necessarily teach CHF much like this anymore. But if you take, if you know what their cardiac index is and you know what their wedge pressure is, and you take this point right here, okay, and you put it on where they are, and you want them less than 15 and above 2.2, follow the arrows. A caveman can do this. Yay. It's not rocket science. It's look at a graph. Some people don't look at the graph, and they wind up you know, guessing and spitballing and stuff like this. There's science out there, and why not use it? Okay. So if you've got somebody who is not beating well, it's like almost heart failure. Heart failure will be over here. Fluid loaded and heart not working well. Get their heart to work better. You can use dopamine, whatever, get their heart working better. And you give them diuretics to get them over here. But what about in the field? If you've got someone who has bad CHF, will you start? What do you start? Do you start nitro? Nitro moves you this way, too. Which is where you want to be. That's why you're starting nitro. You're decreasing that resistance on that heart, having that heart work a little bit better, supplying blood to the kidney so they can actually pee. Holy cow. That's where you're doing nitro. I'll show you a graph while you're doing nitro. Okay? Do the nitro to have the heart beat better before you do. If you have any if anybody has a diuretic that they're able to give, do not give the diuretic until the nitro's been on for like 10 minutes or so, please have the heart beat better and supply the kidneys before you actually give a diuretic. Otherwise, the diuretic is not actually getting to the kidneys like we wanted to. Have the kidney supply be better before you give the diuretic. You know, there's some, some units out there that have diuretics. Start the nitro, let that run for a little bit, then do a diuretic, ideally, okay? So there are ways that we can ways that we can actually dose stuff once we know some of these numbers, okay? That's why I'm telling you some of these things, okay? Um, any questions on cardiogenic shock stuff? Realize if you stress the heart with the resistance, you're going to make the heart sicker, okay? But you need them to also have a good blood pressure. Yes, I don't have a good answer for you. You give them a lot of fluids, that's not necessarily your friend either. I know, I don't have a good answer for you. You start with dopamine, start with some other stuff like that, okay? Dobutamine sounds good, but you got to cover for, for that reflex hypotension. Septic shock. There's other guidelines out there as well. Don't have to even think about this stuff. Make sure that they have enough volume. Sepsis is really well that it is, is okay. Let me explain. I'm over explaining this. I'm making it 
where like a doctor will punch me in the face that is too simplified, but it is mostly true. If I take a dirty, disgusting nail or needle and scratch your, your hand, it gets inflamed, right? Why? Why? And, and your white blood cells need to come out and fight it, right? So it gets inflamed to cause, to limit, to try to en enclose that exposure and to get the white cells there, okay? Now let's say I put dirty and disgusting stuff in your, in your vessels. What did that do? Same thing. They expand out. That's really what's going on with sepsis, septic shock. Heart's fine. The volume's fine. Vasculature just got really huge. Okay. Well, how can you fix that? Best fix in the whole world? Fluids. 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 And fluids. Until they're CVP. Granted, you don't have that monitor. I don't necessarily have that monitor until the doc puts it in. Until their CVP is about like 10. It's more between 8 and 10. But it's going to be a while. It'll be a couple liters in before they may come close to that. Unless, of course, they have CHF. But you've got somebody who, their, their history is like, boy, they had an infection, they're hypotension. You can get a couple liters in probably, get their, get their fluid up, OK? Because all they have on now, the garden hose that was good, now they got the fire hose. And the reason why? The bacteria's in there. Your body's doing what it should do. Just happens to be, oh, yes, you also need blood pressure. Oh, darn. That vicious cycle thing we need to break. Make sense? What's going on with septic shock? OK, CVP less than 8, you give a lot of fluids. We look for a mean arterial pressure of 65. Anything less than 50, you're not supplying enough blood. 65 is really your best bet. If their heart rate is greater than 100, which most of the time it is, if you've got someone with low blood pressure and their heart rate is not greater than 100, I, they might have a drug on board causing that, like a beta blocker. Okay? More than likely it is. So you would add norepi. Norepi is your drug of choice for sepsis. So if you're picking up somebody who's septic and they're not on norepi and they're somewhat tachycardic, I'd be suspicious why they're still on norepi. Not that you need to ask for something else. Hopefully you're just transporting from one place to another. But realize that person is not on probably the best pressure they should be on. There might be a reason they're on that one, but I'm just letting you know it's not ideal for you. Okay. Um, if their heart rate is less than 100, could be because beta block or something else, or just because, you could give them dopamine. Okay. And you're really looking for the mean arterial pressure, like I said. When you get to a point where you can, you get their blood pressure stabilized, and they're still, you get a mixed venous. This gets very complicated. I'm telling you too much. Um, if they're mixed venous, oxygen, somewhere, we're now we're really to a point where we're fine tuning. Well, the person's going to live, but boy, you can make them so much better. You can possibly add just a little bit of dobutamine to have the heart beat better to actually get a better supply. And it's like, it's like a recipe. You follow the recipe, the person's better. Sometimes people don't follow the recipe, and then you have to pick them up and maybe take them somewhere else or, or whatever. Just trying to let you know what is normally the case that should occur. So if you pick up somebody who's in septic shock, these are things you should be seeing unless, obviously, there's other reason, there's some other core morbidity, some other reason why. What I want you to take away from this, you can give epi, you can give dopamine, all those things. Realize the difference of the dosing of the dopamine, okay? Will cause different effects, a little more cardiac, then a lot more vasculature. You can stress out the heart. When you're clamping on the vasculature, you're not helping the heart. Epi does help the heart, but only for a short period of time. You can actually overpower that. Back in the day, sometimes people would do high dose epi. The reason why it fell out of favor, and really wasn't in favor to begin with, is yes, you can get somebody back because you overpower that acidosis. You know where. I can, you can see the reason why they wanted to use high-dose epi. The person's been acidotic. I want to give them more epi to equal a milligram-ish. Well, we really don't know how much more to give them, but they, you know, so they give them more. But it causes so much resistance, you're going to cause someone's heart to fail. Okay? So that's why it fell out of why you really shouldn't do it. I, as long as you understand also the agitation of why some, some people do it. 
Any other questions at all? Is that stuff you already knew? Trying to explain the why. Granted, yes, your med person told you because I said so, and maybe explained it. I'm trying to really give you the science why. So if you have to go off reservation or have to call, maybe you have an idea what you can ask for. All right. That's it. I don't have anything else. I've bored you enough.